And this is especially true in children, and you may not see this quite as clearly, but again, the unigender distribution simply doesn't work, and it doesn't work in children. But the most serious discrimination is in race. This is the uh, incidence of hypertension in, uh, these are between 27 and 30 BMI. And notice that that BMI, Chinese Asians have a 44% incidence of hypertension, American blacks 34%, and American whites 26% at exactly the same BMI. And if you look at diabetes, it's not quite as bad, but look at Chinese at the very same BMI, very same BMI, the Chinese counterpart have a 17% that rate of diabetes and Americans 11%, and you just heard the big data on the Indian population. So the BMI also discriminates against race. And then the real question is, how closely are BMI and diabetes really associated? Is there really a cause and effect relationship? If so, why are only one third of our patients who are, di who are severely obese diabetic? And even the bigger question, why are 10% of the diabetic patients lean? It's not a cause and effect relationship. And these are very early figures from uh, Dr. Lakdawala in India. Notice there's no change whatsoever in the BMI. And notice glycosylated hemoglobins drop sharply, postprandial insulins, fasting blood sugars, postprandial blood sugars, all without a change in weight. And you've heard the other papers here before. So in short, the BMI is a terrible measure. Discriminates on the basis of gender, race, age, fitness, and fat distribution. And the relationship of the weight is not clear either. So the first mission is we need to delete the 35-40 rule, but we've got to come up with something better because we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So probably we'll have to do something like the BMI plus adding comorbidities, racial factors, just like a Glasgow scale or an APGAR scale. And we need this quickly. And the only way we can do it is with prospective randomized controlled studies that compare the best medical and surgical therapies. We need to do that now, and we need to get the funding. The United States National Institutes of Health spent $115 million on the Look Ahead study, which tested diets and wasn't very helpful. I think this deserves at least similar funding. And the second mission is we need to design a better delivery system. Let me give you some data. Uh, even though I'm a cartoonist, say, I, had, I thought I'd show this to you because I don't understand it. So let me put it in cartoon terms, much easier to understand. But look at this. The predicted prevalence of obesity in the United States at 2020, these are CDC figures, is at, and notice we now call a BMI of 35 as a class 2 obesity. Talk about downgrading severity. And notice that in a decade, one-fourth of the women in this country will exceed that BMI. Let me put it in different terms. If you look at the numbers, again, 2020, this means we will be confronted with 30 million Americans with a BMI over 40 and 72 million Americans with a BMI over 35. How are we going to deliver the care? Today, the estimate again by the CDC is that we have 37.3 million Americans who have either diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes. And just the new cases alone are 1.6 million people. And if we were, had to operate on just this group of people, just this group of people, every bariatric surgeon would have to do 800 cases. So let's look at our manpower. I don't, no one really knows how many people are doing bariatric surgery, but so we have to guess at it. We have 1,664 surgical members of the ASMBS, 
a number are now longer operating. We have about a, maybe 350 non-members out there, give or take 2,000 bariatric surgeons. We have 376 centers of excellence with 650 surgeons. So we have some rough ideas. And while this uh, curve looks really remarkable in the way it's going up, remember up to, we're only up to 220,000 patients. In other words, our current record is that we are offering the surgery to less than 1% of those eligible. Can any of you imagine having a pill out there that reverses diabetes, controls, controls weight in a durable manner, uh, reverses sleep apnea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then denying 99% of the population who could benefit from that pill? The American public wouldn't stand for it. So we've got to think a little bit more. So what can we do? First of all, we've got to recognize that obesity is not an epidemic, it is a pandemic of metabolic syndrome as well as obesity. And frankly, the surgical therapies are being shown daily to be significantly better and safer than medical approaches. But the eligible population is huge and growing and we cannot deliver the surgery and all of the associated care with it by ourselves. So you know, cardiac surgeons have cardiologists, neurosurgeons have neurologists, and we're standing all by ourselves. I think it's time, and this is not a new idea, we need bariologists, we need primary care physicians and extenders who are prepared, who are enthusiastic, who can assess the candidates, provide the long-term follow-up and get the data, provide the education for the public, and deal with emergencies. Now I know there's a process underway with various other organizations, with TOS and with uh, SAGES and so on, but frankly, nothing's happening. And I was so pleased today to hear Phil Shower in the meeting that we had in the committee saying, we're going to get moving. We have to because we will not be able to take care of the patients appropriately. And finally, the third mission <coughs> is we need a voice in this healthcare debate, and I've heard virtually nothing. So we better than anyone understand the challenge. And we've got to guide this demand. I mean, this demand is going to hit us like a tsunami. We need to guide the development of the resources and do that now. And that includes public and professional education all the way around. We've got to manage the data, pursue the research, help industry develop the right products, and do it all within a fiscal viable framework. And most important, we have to be at the political tables all around the world to deliver a strong unified message. So in conclusion, it's in tell you it's a very, very great honor to be chosen to celebrate the career of Dr. Edward E. Mason, MD, and a PhD. He's launched a wonderful specialty, but let's prepare for an even greater future. Delete the 3540 rule, design a better delivery system, demand a voice, and as a final, Request from a father of six. The next meeting, let's not hold it on Father's Day. Thank you very much. <laughs>